So welcome everybody to my presentation. I'm um, Tillman. I work for a company called CrowdStrike, which is an American startup that um, deals with targeted attacks. But today I'm going to talk about something else. Uh, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics, one of my hobby hobbies, uh, which is peer-to-peer um, -peer botnets. And peer-to-peer -peer botnets are interesting because they're designed to be resilient against attacks, right? And um, I'm usually trying to attack botnets and have fun with them. So, um, let's see. So yeah, there's an agenda. Um, okay, let's, let's start with a quick uh, introduction to peer-to-peer -peer botnets. Uh, I guess most people in the room here are familiar with peer-to-peer -peer networks in general. Um, I mean, there are networks like you know, BitTorrent, um, eDonkey, like file sharing networks, uh, and others. And usually the purpose is um, to build a decentralized infrastructure that's self-reorganizing. So if parts of the infrastructure go offline, um, you know, it recovers itself and so on. Um, and usually people build peer-to-peer -peer networks in general because they, don't, they want to get rid of any central components um, so the infrastructure cannot be taken down so easily. Um, when you analyze a peer-to-peer -peer network of some sort, um, you want to understand the protocol first. Um, that's not too much of a problem for all the popular file sharing networks because they're well documented, but if you look at peer-to-peer -peer botnets, well, they usually use their proprietary protocols that you have to reverse engineer first and understand first. So you have to look at the samples, do the reverse engineering and so on. Um, but if you do that for um, several peer-to-peer -peer networks, you, you will at some point uh, see that um, there are different approaches. One is based on gossiping. So if you think about that, you have all these different nodes that are interconnected somehow, and you want to propagate some information in this peer-to-peer -peer network, right? You can either do that by what we call gossiping. So each peer kind of gossips information to its neighbors. So it basically forwards information um, to all its neighbors, and these do the same and so on. Um, but you can, if you think about that, that's probably not very effective, right? Because probably several peers will receive um, information several times. So you fill up the network with, with more information than you actually want to or have to. So uh, more advanced P2P networks use um, what people call an overlay network. So you have addressing on top of you know, the general addressing methods like IP. Um, so every peer has an ID or some sort of address. And then there is a routing method so you can address specific peers. And if you want in to send information to a specific peer, then, well, you can, if you know its address, you can route that through the P2P network. An example for that is, um, is eDonkey. You have a distributed hash table on top of you know, the IP network. Every peer has a hash, which is at the same time its ID, its address. And then you can look up data in the hash table and so on. But I'm not going, going into detail um, about that. One important thing when we talk about P2P networks is um, bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is the process of establishing connectivity with the peer-to-peer -peer network when a new peer comes online. And um, that's a very important aspect. That's a very important thing because when you think about that, you want to get rid of any central um, entities in your in your peer-to-peer -peer network, right? So um, might not be a good idea to have a seed server that all peers um, contact to request an initial peer list, right? That would be a central component and you don't want to have that. So what people are doing is they deliver a seed list, a seed list of other peers together with the node itself, right? So for example, with the executable, that's then executed on the, on the um, node system. But what happens if these peers go offline for some reason or if they are not online, um, the computers have been switched off or something, um, then you need a fallback method. And um, that's where it's getting interesting. And um, if you look at the, um, at the box at the right-hand side, um, the third entry is Configure, which is a very famous or infamous uh, piece of malware that was active in 2009 and the following years and still is very active. And Configure used random scanning. So it scanned the internet for other peers randomly and of course there's no way to block that, right? There is no um, information that the bot relies on when it's, when it, when it's first started. It just starts scanning the internet and f until it finds other peers and then it can learn other peers from that one and so on. Do that recursively to um, establish connectivity with the network. Yeah, speaking of that box, that's my own uh, private history of P2P botnets I analyzed. So I started in 2008 with um, the Stormworm 
um, which used the um, eDonkey or yeah eDonkey network or Kademlia network or protocol um, together with some other people. Some of them are here in this room. Um, there are earlier peer-to-peer -peer botnets that are known. Um, I think Nugash was active in 2007, and um, maybe there were some others, but uh, I think, think Nugash from 2007 is the earliest I know personally. Um, then there was Walladak, which um, people believe is a successor of the Stormworm, um, because Storm was, you know, it caught a lot of attention by researchers, um, and lots of, lots of security people try to you know, investigate storm and try to understand the protocol. Some even designed attacks, how you can attack the P2P network to knock it offline or you know, take it offline, take the nodes offline. Um, so apparently the people behind it decided to abandon it at some point and turn or create a new botnet and that was called Walladak and that was not relying on any existing P2P infrastructure. So no, no, um, no um, eDonkey anymore. Instead they implemented their own proprietary protocol which was very similar to Oh, maybe I shouldn't say very similar to to, um, to eDonkey, um, but you know the overall uh, concept behind the botnet had similar uh, um, structures and um, design characteristics. So that's why people said it's um, probably a successor of Storm. Um, yeah. Then I already mentioned Configure. Configure was interesting because it started out as a um, bot that was entirely centralized with its command and control infrastructure. Um, many of you probably have heard about the DGA, the domain name generation algorithm that it included. So it generated pseudo random domain names all the time and then tried to contact, resolve these and contact that host and ask for basically updates. Um, later on these people switched to, so in version C, they, the third version, they switched to a peer to peer uh, protocol as a fallback command and control channel because there was some effort to um, block access to the generated domain so they needed something else otherwise they would lose their, their 8 million nodes botnet, right? Um, so that was Configure and then the, in 2010 I believe, late 2010, the Kilios era started. That's a bot that's also known as HLUX or um, yeah, I think HLUX is the, the other uh, most well known name. Um, and that again is believed to be a successor of Walladak and that is because Walladak was taken down by some people and myself um, with a peer-to-peer -peer poisoning attack and I will talk about that a little bit more uh, in a minute. So um, that button was taken away from them so again they created a new one and that was called um, Kilios A and that's actually interesting because um, if you look at the list, um, Kilios A was attacked as well with success. So they created Kilios B, a successor, and tried to fix some stuff. That was taken down as well. And um, again, they created um, Kilios C, a third version. Um, we attacked that as well. Um, it wasn't too successful. It somewhat survived because we didn't manage to own all the peers. Um, and uh, just recently, they changed something in the protocol and added uh, private public key encryption to it. It doesn't make sense at all because, um, you know, um, you might want to encrypt your traffic, but you can do that, this with symmetric encryption. It doesn't make sense to do private public key stuff because the peers have to, you know, generate their own keys and exchange uh, keys and so on. And um, I mean, anybody can do that, right? You can still infiltrate the botnet by just doing the same, so it doesn't make sense. Anyhow. Um, okay, and then uh, in 2011, there was the uh, minor botnet, and I will show you some protocol examples for that. Uh, a really stupid. Uh, a uh, piece of malware that was written in .NET if I'm not mistaken and the protocol was HTTP based so it was a plain text protocol and they made several mistakes so it was trivial to take down. Um, okay. And um, the remaining two, um, Zero Access and P2P Zeus are um, somewhat interesting because they're still around and they're really successful. They're some of the most, of the biggest and most prevalent botnets that are around these days and they're mostly used for um, dropping other malware on the infected system, especially zero access. It's basically a platform um, that is used to deploy other malware, um, like click bots and so on. Um, zero access is actually sp split into, I think, seven or eight separate botnets. Um, yeah, I don't know why. Maybe they have some affiliate program or something. Um, they also distinguish between 64 and 32 bit systems because they want to be able to, I don't know, in inject DLLs into other processes and that might make sense to. Uh, maintain two separate infrastructures. Okay, well, um, going back to my slide here, um, obviously 
people build peer-to-peer -peer botnets because they want to, they have the same goals as other people who build P2P networks, right? They want to create a resilient infrastructure that is resilient against, take, against takeover attempts or takedown attempts. So that's the goal. Um, and that's why, um, you know, they're getting somewhat popular. Um, I'm sure there are other P2P botnets out, near, out there that are not on my list. I'm aware of a few, but I haven't looked into them, so I'm not going to talk about them. Um, interestingly, um, for I think all, yeah, all botnets that you've seen on the previous list, the architecture is not entirely, not purely peer-to-peer. -peer. It's a hybrid architecture. It's what you see here. So the, the thing at the bottom, bottom is the actual peer-to-peer -peer network, and the dashed lines um, represent um, a peer being in the peerless of another peer. But um, when they want to receive commands uh, for, I don't know, sending out spam or something like that, they still um, reach out to central components. And the boxes you see in the middle, can you see that? Yeah. The boxes you see in the middle are um, proxy servers, so they usually have another layer in between, um, like systems, like burner systems. So if one of, some of the proxy servers get taken down, they can easily replace them without losing their command and control infrastructure. And then there is a command and control server on top that is the actual backend, okay? There might actually be multiple layers between, in between the P2P network and the, the C2, but, um, well, unless you get access to, the, to one of the proxy servers, you don't see what's behind it. Um, but we, we're fairly certain that in most cases these are proxy servers because, you know, for example, when they speak HTTP and they respond with an Nginx um, banner, then, well, you can be certain that it's a proxy. Most likely, at least. Okay, um, let's take a look at some protocol examples so you get an idea uh, what these people create and come up with. This is the already mentioned um, minor bot. Um, and as I've said, that was really a trivial and also stupid protocol. Um, it was HTTP based and the bots, all the bots implemented their own uh, tiny HTTP server. I mean, it wasn't a full-blown HTTP server, but, you know, just a very rudimentary one that was backed up by the, by the file system. So if you would issue a GET request with the search um, parameter and the, um, uh, you know, the IP list 2 value, um, that file name would be looked up in the respective directory and then delivered to the requesting host. Okay? Um, so it was really, I mean, if there were other um, files on the file system in that directory, you could request them as well with this method. And that was probably not intended by them. Um, yeah, anyhow. So you can see the response here. In that case, I think the Nginx server header is, is fake. They just copied that from somewhere and, and sent it with the, uh, the responses. Um, and you can see at the bottom is the, the actual payload, a list of other peers, a list of IP addresses. And minor always responds with the entire peer list that it, that it has, right? All peers that it knows about. Um, and that's stupid because <laughs> this can be huge. Uh, and also that makes it easy for us to, you know, enumerate the bots and understand how many infected machines there are and so on. If we want to attack it, for example. So, I mean, this is only the, f the start, right? You can see it's 11K in size and this is by far not the largest request or response we've seen. Um, you can try to um, recreate this this peer-to-peer -peer graph because it's basically a graph, right? It's nodes who know about other nodes and talk to other nodes and so on. So it's basically a graph. You can try to recreate that by crawling peers, and I, we will talk more about crawling. I mean, that's a that's the topic of the talk, right? Uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, but if you request a peer list from one peer, you can um, recreate these links in the graph and then take the response, the IP address from the response you got back and do the same for these and so on. And then, um, you know, plot pretty pictures like this one here. I think that's about th um, 37K nodes, uh, which is only a subset of the, um, of the minor botnet at that time. But um, it takes like ages to, to render this, uh, this picture here. So we only did that um, for a subset of the nodes we, uh, we found. You can see that, that other P2P protocols are somewhat similar. This is zero access version one. There are two versions out there. This is the earlier version. Um, and they define, again, it's a proprietary protocol um, that they implemented. They define, I think, six different message types. And one is a get L, um, which means get list, get peer list from another peer. And the red L is the uh, return peer list message. Um, this is 
what you get when you reverse engineer the, the message format and, and decode it. So, um, I mean, and, and parse it. It's not plain text. Um, I think, I think zero access version one had a four byte key that it hashed with MD5 and then used that MD5 hash as an RC4 key to decrypt its, its message, messages, but it was always the same key, so, um, it was basically, uh, symmetric encryption with a non, with a static key. Um, and the other version just used XOR with, um, another key. Um, version two. So if you, if you undo the encryption, you end up with something like this and, um, you can see here, um, in the case of zero access version one, a peer list has 256 entries, so it always returns 250, up to 256 entries. But, um, since the, um, botnet is so, is large enough, every peer has always more than 256 entries at a time, um, at any time. So whenever you ask a peer for its peer list, you will get these, most likely these 256 entries. And you can see there's some order there. So the first, um, the first number is a timestamp or a time delta, so to speak, um, because, um, the botnet favors peers that have recently been active. And that makes sense because you don't want to keep, maybe if that is your strategy, you don't want to keep like, um, peers from the stone, stone ages in your peer list that might be offline already, or, you know, they reboot from time to time, get a new IP address. So the entry becomes invalid. Uh, instead you want, might want to favor, um, peers that have recently become online or that you have recently talked to. So that's why they sort these peer lists by, by the time delta and then return the, 256 most recent ones. They changed this protocol a little bit in, uh, version two. So this is zero access version two. And, um, you can see there are, again, these two message types. I've already mentioned that the encryption is slightly different, but, um, uh, for the most part, the protocol is very similar. So there is get L and red L. Again, you have the timestamps and you have the IP address, but, um, they figured that they don't need to send back 256 IP addresses. That's way too much. You know, uh, it's sufficient if you respond with only 16 IP addresses that makes the message smaller. So, you know, less overall communication in the botnet. And the reason is, I mean, zero access version two is really huge. Um, we've crawled some of the, some of the botnets and they count like, you know, 3.7 million. I think that was the count we got. 3.7 million infected machines. And if you have 3.7 million machines talking to each other, that's a lot of traffic. So you might want to reduce the message size. Um, so that's what they did. But if you take a look at the IP addresses, um, <laughs> you might notice that the um, last octet looks uh, a little bit strange. It's always very high. And that is because they do some deduplication. You don't want two uh, or multiple entries with the same IP address in your peer list, obviously, because if you allow that, it's trivial for other people to poison your peer list and inject one entry multiple times and override all the legitimate ones, and then you're not connected to the peer botnet anymore, right? Uh, to the peer to peer botnet anymore. So that's why they do deduplication. And in order to do that, they sort the IP addresses and then, you know, go over the sorted list. And if, you know, they have two following, two, two consecutive entries that have the same IP address, they kick one out. But because IP addresses are, at least on PCs, sort of in, in, in little endian, um, you know, and they sort them, you have in the result, um, these IP addresses with a high last octet, uh, in the response. Um, what's interesting is that they do that, but they don't filter out invalid IP addresses. So when you crawl the botnet, you come across IP addresses like 255, 255, 255, 255, so all bits set, which obviously is an invalid IP address, but it regularly shows up in these lists because it's, you know, when you sort the list, um, decreasing order, then it's the topmost entry and it's always included. Uh, and they have some other garbage in there. So for some reason, they don't filter out these, these, these entries, which is interesting. Okay, um, let's, let's talk about crawling. So, I mean, crawling is nothing else but recursively enumerating peers. You start with one peer, you request its peer list, you take a look at the response and do the same for all the returned addresses, right? And so on until you, you know, want to go offline or I don't know. Um, so, um, that's all, what cr all that crawling is, but, um, you really want to think about a crawling strategy, um, and uh, one, one important thing is crawling speed. So ideally we would be able to take a snapshot of the current peer-to-peer -peer graph and then, you know, um, uh, enumerate the peers of that, in that snapshot, but that's not possible. First off, because, uh, you know, you have to do that actively. You have to send out requests and process the responses and that takes time. And while you're doing that, the structure of the graph might be changing, right? Peers might go offline, new peers might come online. 
So you will never be able to get that snapshot, right? Uh, but to come closest to that, you want to be as quickly as possible. Um, yeah, um, and when you do that, you have to think about things like unresponsive peers. What if you, if somebody sends you an IP address back that's offline? How do you deal with that? Do you want to keep it in the list and try again later? Uh, I mean, you don't know why it's unresponsive, right? You might lose packets. The network might be uh, overwhelmed with your traffic because you try to be as fast as possible. Um, you don't know why it's unresponsive or, yeah, there is some hiccup on the internet. Um, so you might want to keep it in the list and try again later, but, um, you know, you can see it's getting uh, a little bit more complex. And what you see uh, in the top right corner is um, the result of us crawling P2P Zeus, which is also uh, known as game over, by the way. Um, and the red, the red line, the red graph shows you the number of IP addresses that we learned. So we call them known peers. But most of them are not actually reachable. Although um, the protocol is pretty robust, so they don't include any invalid IP addresses in it. Um, um, but most of them are not actually reachable. So if you count only the peers that you can talk to, you end up with a green line and you can see it's uh, way less. Uh, and you see, if you see these little dips in the red line, that, that is because for Zeus peer to peer, uh, peer to peer Zeus, we uh, chose a strategy where we cleaned up the list of known peers from time to time. So we said, okay, these are unresponsive for too long now. Let's kick them out, out to keep the list small because otherwise, you know, we, you have an endlessly growing list. Uh, but you, what you can also see is um, that the green line converges very quickly um, and um, that means you have probably reached the number you are able to crawl and that gives you some size estimation, okay? Okay, yeah, there's some fancy animation here. Um, you might wonder why uh, why anybody wants to crawl P2P botnets at all. I mean, it's interesting to, to play with that. It's interesting to understand the protocol and uh, re-implement re it and so on and then, then, then play with the botnet and maybe, you know, snoop on what they're doing. Um, but uh, we usually have other goals. I mean, reconnaissance is usually the, the foremost thing, right? But why do you want to, uh, uh, to learn something about the peer, uh, to peer botnet and the infected machines? I've already mentioned size estimation. If you talk to the press, um, they really like high numbers. So if you tell them, um, you know, zero access is 10 million infected machines large, they, they will love that. But next time you have to tell them the bottom is 15 million infected machines large or something. Um, so, yeah, size estimation is one thing. But you have to be aware that you can only crawl a subset of, of the infected machines. Most of them obviously are, you know, behind NAT, behind gateways. You can't directly talk to them. You can't reach them from from the internet, right? But they're still part of the PTP botnet. They're like leaf nodes in this graph. Um, so um, it's it's not trivial. If you do what we did for PTP Zeus and you end up with this green line and you get a number of machines that you can talk to, you have to extrapolate from that extrapolate from that number um, to uh, to get to a more realistic size estimation. Infection tracking is something uh, that people are doing who want to uh, remediate or, or, you know, kill these botnets. They uh, want to learn about infected machines and then can report the IP addresses to, let's say, ISPs who then pass the information on to uh, their customers and hopefully they clean up the machine so the botnet uh, dies off. Um, but I've never really seen that uh, being successful. Um, geographic distribution is something you can also get from that. If you have all the IP addresses, you can do geolocation lookups and then uh, if you want to plot them on a map like what we did here. And I want to mention uh, Mark Schlosser and some other guys who uh, uh, created the code we based this on. Um, this is actually a live thing. So we, we send in a live feed of uh, the crawling results and that displays these nice little red dots. Okay, um, but what we're usually after is um, we want to attack peer-to-peer -peer botnets. So, um, I mean, if you can, for example, if you know all the nodes, you might want to try and send them commands yourself, right? If you also understood the command, command control protocol. Um, there are sometimes interesting commands like uninstall commands. If you can send an uninstall command to all the bots you've identified uh, and they are the ones you can talk to, so it's the backbone of the whole graph, so to speak, right? Um, then you can kill the botnet entirely. Or if you can, I don't know, uh, send requests for more information about the infected machines. You can, for example, get information about the operating system version or other stuff. 
So that's usually interesting as well. Uh, but you can also probably manipulate the peer-to-peer -peer infrastructure. So uh, think about it. If you um, can generate your own peer list and then propagate these in the peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, you can create edges, you can kill other edges by replacing them and so on. So you can basically um, um, you know, tamper with that infrastructure and we will talk more about that in a little bit. Um, ideally you, I mean you might be able to sync all the, the whole thing by replacing all legitimate entries in the peer list with your own ones and by that have all peers talking to your own machines. Which means that nobody else has access over them anymore. Um, if you think about crawling strategies you might ask yourself uh, do I want to implement a, a depth first search or, or a BFS? But it doesn't really matter, at least that's what we think, because first off it's not a, it's not a tree, it's a graph. Um, I mean you can distinguish the two, two strategies anyway, but it doesn't really matter uh, because it's dynamic. So, you know, it's changing all the time anyway, so it doesn't really matter which node, nodes you, uh, you, you start with and which nodes you continue with. Um, at some point if you're quick enough, uh, fast enough, you will hopefully be able to learn uh, the biggest part of the, the regional machines. Um, if you track the infected machines, you need to be able to distinguish uh, have I seen that IP address or have I seen that peer before? Do I want to include it in my list or, uh, um, or is it a new one? And if you rely on IP addresses only, um, that's a bit of a problem because uh, I've already mentioned there is a lot of IP churn, um, um, you know, IP addresses that change after 24 hours and if you happen to crawl a peer or contact a peer and then the IP address changes and you contact it again, you count it twice. So you want to avoid that otherwise you get um, uh, screwed numbers. Um, some peer-to-peer -peer protocols are nice. They implement unique IDs, especially the ones uh, that implement overlay networks because you need them for routing, right? Um, and if you have that, well, then you can uh, have more accurate numbers. Something not working. Wow, he just gave it to me. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, so part of the DEF CON experience is uh, the best uh, technical talks uh, delivered by uh, the top speakers. It's very hard to get accepted to give a talk here. Um, you all should consider what you're doing to maybe become a speaker at some point. Um, this gentleman, this is his first time. Let's give him a big round of applause. So we have another tradition at DEF CON. Typically first time speakers do a shout on stage. So, <laughs> cheers. All right. Hmm. <laughs> We've had to do this all day. All right. And now we'll see if he can pick up the talk and start off where he left off. And I know that some of you have probably seen this many times. I'm going to not make him do that entire speech next time. <laughs> <laughs> Does my voice sound any different? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I need one more to uh, nullify the previous one. No. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Now you'd be better. Good job. Okay, let's finish this before the stuff kicks in. Um, yeah, we already said that um, you're done with the crawling um, when this, this curve converges because you don't learn any about any new peers anymore. Um, and if there are some changes, then it's due to um, churn. So what you see here um, is an analysis of the convergence for um, for the P2P botnets we crawled. I hope you can read that. I, I realize it's rather small, but uh, on the on the left hand side you see a uh, curve similar to the one we had on the previous slide, like the, the, the actual number of machines that we identified. Um, and you can see the um, I mean it depends on the size of the botnet of course. The, the, the upper curves are zero axis, which I already mentioned are pretty large, so you uh, get way more hits. And the ones at the bottom are um, let me see. Um, so that's a botnet called Sality that I have 
haven't looked into myself, but one of my, my friends has, and he has provided these numbers. Um, so you can see, depending on the size of the botnet, um, the scale is different, but the, um, the shape is more or less the same, right? So you can see that all of them uh, kind of converge against a straight line, and um, um, then you know you're more or less done. You can also take a look at the um, population increase, or yeah, increase in percent, and that's what is played on the right hand side, uh, which basically correlates with the other graphs, right? Yeah, so um, oh, by the way, I did mention that I'm going to read some code after this uh, presentation. So we, we figured that whenever we want to crawl a P2P botnet, uh, we ended up writing the same code. So after some time, we said, okay, let's build some basic code that, uh, you know, we can add the protocol implementation to, but, you know, do it right once and then, you know, add, add the uh, changing stuff to that. Uh, and I'm going to release that um, as open source later on. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so how do you distinguish peers? And I already talked about that. You um, have IP addresses, unique IP addresses versus, versus IDs in the case where you have IDs. Uh, in the case where you haven't, you can still um, derive some, you know, uh, conclusions from, from other cases where IDs are available. And what you see here, I mean, I'm cheating a little bit here because these graphs are not uh, generated by crawling this botnet. That's actually um, Kilio C. So, the last version that was attacked um, earlier this year. Um, these numbers are not uh, generated by crawling the botnet, but in this case we did a node injection, so we propagated a special peer list entry in the peer-to-peer -peer network, and then uh, it became very prominent, and then all the other peers uh, reached out to that machine. And by this you even get the ones that are not directly reachable, because at some point the entries propagate through NAT and through gateways and so on. Um, so this gives you way more accurate numbers, um, and that allows us to um, to compare the IP address count with the ID count. And what you see here is, um, so green is the total number of bots, so that's the total number of unique IDs, and blue is the number of IP, uh, yeah, unique IP addresses, and you can see that this goes uh, up uh, even though we have seen all or almost all um, unique IDs. So the like slope or what's co whatever it's called is uh, much slower for the green line. And that's actually very similar. So um, the, the ratio between the two after, say, 24 hours or 48 hours is almost the same for all botnets we've taken a look at. And I mean, we have a paper out on that where you uh, can uh, take a look at all the, the numbers, um, but I'm not going to cover that here. So you can see after 24 hours, that's where um, the two lines cross. So um, even if you don't have unique IDs, you can say, I take a look at the IP addresses I can collect in 24 hours, and that gives me probably pretty accurate numbers. Yeah, I already mentioned speed. Speed is important. You want to be as quickly, as fast as possible. But um, being fast is not easy. I mean, if it's uh, if the protocol is UDP based, it's a little bit easier because you don't have to worry about session establishment and so on and timeouts. Um, actually, uh, I didn't get to finish the UDP code. Um, most of these botnets use UDP for a reason. I mean, it's uh, the overhead is less. Uh, but I didn't get, didn't get to finish uh, the, the crawler template code for UDP, uh, so that's la left as an exercise for you, or you wait until I'm done with it and check it into the repo. Um, but UDP is way simpler. Um, usually people have either two threads, one that um, sends out messages and one that consumes incoming messages. But uh, if you do that, and actually many bots work that way, actually most of uh, the UDP ones we have seen, if you do that, you have to worry about synchronization. So you have to, you know, have a peer list that you lock when you want to send out stuff, or you know, select the peer that you want to send send data to, or when you receive data, you also probably want to lock the peer list. So you have to synchronize the two. So we usually um, use non-blocking I/O in the main loop and just a single thread, so because it's faster and uh, code is a little bit more complex. But yeah, um, when you're talking TCP, it's um, yeah, a little bit more difficult. You have to establish uh, TCP connections and you have to worry about timeouts because you don't want to get DOS, right? Um, if you don't worry about all these things and you, you crawl the network, they might like open half open, uh, create half open connections and not respond to you at all or keep connections open forever that are established and then you're running out of file descriptors and uh, your crawling doesn't work anymore. So you probably want to have like a limited set of file descriptors or sessions that you're able to handle. Um, so what we do, what the code does that I'm going to share uh, publicly is it allocates a fixed number of slots for sessions 
And um, I mean, that's the amount of um, simultaneous sessions the code can handle. And um, you know, when it wants to contact a new peer, it takes the next free slot from that array. So by that, you make sure that your crawler doesn't get DOS. Yeah, I talked about timeouts already. Um, another thing is, if you talk to a peer, then you can, I mean, definitely say that it's live, that it exists, right? Thank you. Um, that it exists. Um, and the question is, how long do you want to keep it uh, in your peer list flagged as active? Because as I've said previously, you want to distinguish between IP addresses or peers that you have encountered, that you have observed, and the ones that you can actually talk to that are live, right? But yeah, if you talk to a peer in his life, for how long do you want to consider it live? Um, so that's another thing. I mean, do you want to keep, uh, consider it live for 24 hours or only three minutes, or do you want to uh, period periodically recontact it? And if it doesn't respond anymore, then you say it's not live anymore. Um, so these are parameters that are really, really important. I mean, it does, might not sound like that, but they are really important, and you might want to tune. You want to tune them for the specific botnet that you are crawling um, to get accurate numbers. Yeah. Also, I mean, packet loss, especially when you're talking UDP. Um, I mean, you can send out lots of UDP packets per time, and if you fill up your own uh, um, um, line, your own uh, pipe with UDP packets, you will have packet loss sometime, and then you get uh, funny, funny results and. Yeah, either get a bigger, bigger, bigger line, bigger um, bandwidth, or slow down a little bit. So you want to have a parameter that allows you to slow down the whole crawl crawling process. So uh, Prowler is the name of the the tool that we're gonna release today. Um, as I've said, it's it just implements the um, crawling framework, so to speak, and you have to add the protocol implementation yourself. It uh, provides you with some some stub functions that get called, um, and that's where you have to implement the protocol. So if you want to check it out, please do. Um, as I've said, it's only TCP for now. Um, yeah, and you can see uh, what it looks like at the bottom of the slide. Uh, you can e even see that it distinguishes between known peers and active peers. And you can s can you see? Yeah, in the, if you take a look at the last two lines, you can see that the number of active peers goes down from um, 719 to 717 and that is because um, you know after some time some peers don't respond anymore so they're not considered active anymore and get uh, flagged as inactive. And um, in that case uh, we were crawling Helios C and that was in February. Um, so my, C, my the, the peer list I started off with is only contained two entries. You see that on the right hand side. Um, and Kilios always shares, if you request another PSP list, it always shares 250 entries. And that is why if you take a look at the, uh, at the first line, why, why, uh, that is why it immediately goes up to 250 known peers, right? It contacts one peer, it learns 250 entries, so it knows, knows 250 other ones immediately, and then it continues from there. But if you take a look at the two graphs, again, the green line is active peers that it can talk to, and the red line is peers that, uh, I have seen in peer lists, you can see that the green line gets uh, constant very quickly. So it converges re really quickly and, uh, you know, somewhere in the range of, I don't know, what, what is that, 700? Yeah, that, that's in line with the numbers below. Uh, and that is because um, Kelios also favors more recent peers. Thank you. Um, more recent peers. Um, so they have this backbone of what they call router nodes and there's never more than uh, in the range of 700. So that's why you will never be able to talk to more than seven, around 700 peer, peers at a time. And you can also see these, um, I don't know, steps or whatever you want to call them in the red curve. And that is because if new peers come online, they propagate in the peer to peer network and become active at some point and then, you know, you get these steps. Because they immediately, when a new peer comes online, they immediately get propagated to all peers that are online and that's what causes this effect. Okay, so um, I'm almost done here. Um, this is the um, Git repository where you can check out the code. As I've said, I will hopefully add a, a UDP version soon. Um, and I mean, I've checked in like uh, that version like one hour before the talk, so there might be some some bugs in there. But I, uh, if you tell me that there is something buggy, I will fix it, or you can fix it yourself and send me a patch. Um, 
But I also want to talk about an, the alternative that we already touched on briefly, which is node injection. Um, as I've said, um, by crawling, you will never be able to reach the peers that are behind gateways, network regression station, and so on. So you can actively participate in the peer-to-peer -peer network um, as an alternative and propagate your own IP addresses. And then at some point, depending on the uh, popularity of your node, the other peers will reach out to you and, you know, say, take me down or send me commands. Um, yeah. Um, and that's actually a comparison here between uh, um, tracking based on sensor injection and crawling. So you can see the, the top two lines are, um, again, this is P2P Zeus, so we have IDs, unique IDs and IP addresses. So we distinguish between the numbers for unique IDs and IP addresses. Of course, the number of IP addresses is much higher. And the top two lines are what we achieved through um, sensor injection and the other lines are uh, what we achieved through, um, through craw crawling. Um, and the bottom lines are the active IP addresses or the active peers that we can talk to. So you see it's uh, much less than the peers that show up in the peer list. Okay, that's uh, basically my presentation. I want to give shouts to some people here because they're awesome um, and um, did some of the work with me here and uh, deserve credit for it. And that's it. Um, I think we have a few more minutes left, maybe three or so. So if you have any questions, you can ask me now or hunt me down at the bar later on. Thank you. <laughs>